Okay, the book of Mark, chapter 13. Chapter 13. And hold your finger in that place there because uh, what we're going to do today is uh, as we just go through it, we'll uh, read certain sections because I'm going to attempt something brave this morning by looking at this whole chapter. And I hope that doesn't mean an extra long sermon, but um, yeah, I just uh, will try and make our way through it. So chapter 13. And when we come to this chapter, as you get through it, you'll be familiar with uh, probably its content, but... um, I guess if there's one question that the whole world would want to know right now is where's the financial crisis that we're in and with Europe and all the the difficulties it's in and different countries there, where is this going to take us? How is this going to affect Australia? Where will we be? How will we be sitting even financially on the world scene uh, in 5 and 10 and 20 years' time because of what's going on down now? And... um, and I guess the future, if it wasn't the financial crisis, has been wars and it's been something else, et cetera, et cetera. The future has always been um, elusive to some extent or to quite an extent and um, it's always concerned and intrigued people, right? The future. What's going to happen? What's going to happen next? And, um, and this chapter before us, uh, known, by the way, as the Olivet Discourse, why it's known as that is because when Jesus was on Mount Olivet, you know, you have Jerusalem there, and then there's a Kidron Valley, then you go up to the mountain range, which is the Olivet Range. So he, he gave this block of teaching on Mount Olivet. So it's known as the Olivet Discourse. This discourse, what it does is it homes in on not an elusive future, not an elusive future, but a certain future. Now, it's certain because it's been decreed by God, right? And so, um, and so that gives it a whole heap of credibility. I'm sure you would agree with that. And, um, and so the problem is when we think about the future, um, it's amazing when something happens, whether it's in the finance arena or particularly in the finance, all of a sudden you will, you will see all these experts pop up. They'll have names like consultants. They'll names, have names like uh, experts or whatever. They'll all pop up and they'll be giving their, their feedback on, uh, on what where this is going to take us, where we will be next year or the five years or what this is going to do. And so they'll be basing their arguments on the future um, primarily on market trends and things like that. And, um, but, but the problem is, just as the world produces its experts and who predict the future based mainly on guesswork and, as I said, market trends, we also have theologians and, and Bible students, they like to have a crack at this as well. And I'm sure you've, uh, you've discovered this uh, over the years if you've had anything to do with, with, with the Bible and, and what, it, what it says. And, um, but one of the passages that come into their foray of, um, um, of their basis of their predictions is this passage that we're going to look at today, known as the Olivet Discourse. There are many others, but this would be one of the primary ones, okay? And so... Um, we, I guess we could say, well, at least these people are looking at the right script. They're not just basing it on guesswork or, or market trends, etc. But at least they're looking at the right script. Um, and so the interpretation of this script in particular, the one we're going to look at today in Mark 13, has always resulted in many different views on the details how everything will unfold under God's sovereign management. There's been a variety of views and there still is. And it produces quite often confusion rather than a settled opinion and a settled stack. And so you'll go from different denomination to different denomination, even different individual to different individual, and there will be a whole variety of views out there. Okay? And so some people will throw their hands up and say, ah, oh, it's too confusing, forget about it, it's irrelevant. Uh, don't do that, um, but at the same time, be sensitive because there are many godly people out there who hold a different view to you and a different view to me and, um, and so let's not fall out over this, okay? Um, but I guess the question, what is going to happen next? What is God's schedule for his world? That is, that is something we can ask and it's a puzzling question that so many people live with. Not only Christians, but people who are not Christians. 
Now, you are not alone on this. You are not alone on this because as we think of history, for centuries, Christians have spent countless energies attempting to do, listen to this, attempting to do something that the Bible never asked them to do. And that is predict the end times. God never has asked us to do that. And so what we're going to talk about today, I do not think that this study this morning, I do not even believe that this study this morning will answer all your questions about the last days. I do not begin to think that it's going to agree with all your preconceived notions or whatever you have as far as how things plan out. I don't even believe it's going to satisfy your curiosity about all the aspects of eschatology, that is, future things. Okay? Because in no other field of Christian study do we have as many, as I said before, ideas, theories, dogmatic assertions, and, and perplexing um, ideas about this and questions. So how are we going to handle this? How are we going to handle it? We're going to handle it like this. Here are my ground rules for handling Mark chapter 13. Okay? My first concern in this studying this portion and looking at this chapter is pastoral, not theoretical. You got that? It's pastoral, not theoretical. And why I say that is I, I really get excited and have been, um, hence I was back in Matthew as well, and uh, the other account of this, Matthew 24, 25, and you go to Luke chapter 21, you have accounts of this from slightly different perspectives and, and more details, and, and a whole lot more details in, in Matthew, of course. But... Um, I get really excited when I see in this section, this, this Olivet Discourse, the amount of imperatives. In other words, the commands that are given. Okay? A whole heap of them right through this section of Scripture. And what I would suggest that this clearly indicates that the passage itself, that Mark himself, that the Spirit of God himself, that God himself is not primarily concerned about revealing the signs of the times as he is, as the Scripture is, promoting faith and obedience in light of such events. Okay? So what I'm saying, this suggestion is powerfully uh, portrayed and it comes through with all these commands that it's, it's in itself is pastoral and not theoretical. It's not interested in giving you dit, 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 all the answers, but wow, it is sure interested in promoting faith and obedience in the light of these future coming events. So I want you to have that in your mind. The passage could almost be summarized with this verse, and I've got this written up here, not a verse, a, it's my um, a summary statement. You focus on obedience to God and being faithful to Him and let God handle the rest of the world, or the end of the world. Okay, I'll say that again, just so that you can have a, a summary statement of the Olivet Discourse. You focus on obedience to God and being faithful to Him and let God handle the end of the world. Okay? Now, if you just take that home today, or if even I sat down, and if you really took that to heart and studied this yourself, I'd be really, really satisfied, and I'm sure the Lord would too. But we will go on. There's one of those buts. And as I say but, I do think that you're wondering, wow, wow, I wonder where the pastor sits on all this, okay? I wonder, where, wonder, where his, wonder what he believes, where, where, how things are all pan out here. And so I only think it's fair to you, and I believe I'd be speaking on behalf of the elders. I know I'm speaking on behalf of the elders here. And even within the eldership, there's a few little details that we may not be all whatever on, but hey, they're peripheral things and we're not worried about that, okay? If they're not fundamentals. And so I, I really believe I need to give you my take on how this chapter fits in God's eschatological program, okay? And so I hold, first of all, now get ready for it, I hold, first of all, and this may shock some of you, that this Olivet Discourse and its whole fulfillment is yet future. Got that? It's yet future. Why I say that is, if you note the context of this discourse, it is clearly dealing, and we will get into it, uh, with issues pertaining to Israel, not the church. Not the church. The church is not even in the picture here. The church is known as a mystery. You go to Ephesians 5.32, you'll see it's a mystery. It's still a mystery in the context of this Olivet Discourse. We don't read anything about the church. We don't read anything about it's being snatched away as we, as we see in John 14.1, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. Nothing of that is here. 
I believe all that church stuff, as far as it's being snatched away, takes, takes place before this, by the way. Okay, that's, by the, that's a by the way comment. So the backdrop of this passage is to do with rejecting the Messiah and the disciplining of Israel. And as we track through Mark, Jesus has suffered a whole lot of rejection. And so it's still in that context, the rejection of, the, of Messiah and the discipline of Israel. So here we have what we have in this section, Jesus answering his disciples who didn't know anything about the church at this stage and were still expecting their Messiah, Jesus, to set up his earthly kingdom in their time in some kind of miraculous and powerful way. They didn't know how it was going to go down, but they were hanging out for this kingdom reign that had been promised right throughout the Old Testament and here was their Messiah, here was their Jesus. They still had some of the main points confused but this is the time that they were hanging out for. They were totally wrapped up in purely Jewish concerns. And so Jesus here, he answers those Jewish concerns by outlining the next major event on God's calendar for Israel which is a unique time of great suffering and tribulation, as it's called here, which again primarily targets Israel, ethnic Israel, God's covenanted people. Yes, the nations in the world will be affected. Even little Australia is not going to get away from this big one. There will be fallout, there will be collateral damage, so to speak, to the rest of the world. But the time of tribulation that's spoken of here in this discourse is all about God's disciplinary hand on Israel to bring her, to return her to the Lord in final fulfillment of the covenants that were made with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Okay? Those unconditional covenants that were made with them. And so here are these happenings that we see here Uh, We see things like wars and rumours of wars and earthquakes. And we say, yeah, but haven't we seen those in our time? Absolutely. They have been happening right throughout the ages. Right throughout the ages. But this discourse is a description of a shorter time period for Israel, specifically to experience. I want you to understand that uh, from where I'm coming from. And so why I say this, by the way, I'm just not going to say it without backing it up with a bit of textual evidence here. So why I say this is because I believe there's a hinge verse that would indicate this discourse refers to a shorter time period rather than the first 70 years since Christ or rather than the 2,000 plus years since Christ. A hinge verse is in verse 8, which says, these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Now we have to understand the images here. Um, Uh, And we have to acknowledge the imagery here. When I think of labour pains, my daughter's not here today, she's about to go through them. I think she was having some yesterday, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, When we think of labour pains, they don't occur. Oh, yes, she is there. She's walking in. Everyone have a look. Yeah, you can see. She's about to experience them if she isn't already. And um, uh, labour pains, they do not... occur at conception, right? Well, they do not and have not begun at the beginning of the church age, which we can call conception. Church age beginning at Pentecost. They don't begin then. Birth pains, labour pains, happen just prior to delivery. Or so many mothers have told me. And what kind of delivery, we can carry on using this imagery here because it's a powerful one because it's not the only time it's used here, so it's not a one-off. Uh, the Spirit of God uses it again in the same context in 1 Thessalonians 5.3. What kind of major delivery was Israel, including the disciples at this very time on Mount Olivet, what kind of delivery were they hanging out for? They were hanging out for the coming of their promised Messiah, right? That's what they were hanging out for. In other words, in keeping with this key imagery, this whole discourse is about a time of tribulation that Israel will yet suffer just prior to the coming of Jesus Christ to rule and reign on earth as the promised king. Simple, right? That's how I read it. And on top of that, there's another one in verse 30 where Jesus said, this generation, people have got hung up on that. 
and say, oh, this generation, it must be the generation that he's speaking to now, the disciples. No, not necessarily. The, the generation living is that when these signs happen, in other words, when these things take place, when it happens, that generation living then will see the beginning to the end. In other words, it's going to be a short period. So a generation may be, what, 20 years? So within that period, the generation living then will see the end. So all this indicates a shorter time period. So what do we have? This is a good question where it comes down to us now, folks. What do we have, Christian Gentiles, living in this church mystery period? What on earth do we have to do with this text? What has it got to do with us? A good question. Do we throw it out and relegate it to the Jewish mailbox? No, because I believe we need to look at what the Spirit of God has recorded here for us all. Because he's recorded here in no uncertain terms that there's, number, there's going to be an end to the age, right? There's going to be an end to this age. He's also recorded in no uncertain terms that will be an end to this world. He's also recorded in no uncertain terms that there will be an end to man's day when God will intervene and there will be a day of reckoning for Israel and also for the entire world. A day of reckoning. There will be a day when this day of the Lord, as it's referred to in other parts of the scripture, will come upon all those who dwell upon the face of the earth. And if you want to go to Luke's account of this discourse, you will see that text. There will be a day coming, will come upon those who dwell upon the face of the earth. So that encompasses everyone. And because of this overriding reality, folks, because of this overriding reality, what is the main theme? What would be the main theme that you'd be thinking of right now where you think, wow, this is going to be reality. It's going to happen. And so we can ask, what is the main thrust of this whole discourse that is relative to Israel, to the entire world, and to the church today and to New Community Church as we sit here this morning? What is the thrust? Simply this. Simply this. Be ready. Be prepared. Be on guard. Why? For God's program, folks, is right on track and any day this mystery period, this church age of unprecedented grace both to Jew and Gentile of which the gospel goes out to both, it's going to end and God will intervene one more final time in human history like he's never done before. And that main pastoral theme runs right through this text and that is one I want to highlight with you this morning for the rest of our session. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, I've got about four points here and um, I'm going to read through the whole chapter. But first of all, my first point is be prepared to stand against deception. Okay, for those who are taking notes, be prepared to stand against deception. And this is from verses 1 to 8. And I'll let me read this for you. And, as he, and I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, ESV, one of the many, many excellent translations that we have today. And as he came out of the temple, that is Jesus, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things be and what will be the signs when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Verse 8, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. As we think back to the first century, we must understand that, um, that things may have been a lot slower then, but curiosity about the future still ran as strong as it does today. And so here were these disciples and Israel in general, um, they were pitched with messianic fever. And I think we saw some of that a couple of chapters back when they sung Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest as Jesus went up into Jerusalem riding on the colt of a donkey. Okay? And so they were pitched with messianic fever and they wanted to know when this kingdom would come and when world powers would be overthrown by their promised Messiah. That's the backdrop of it. 
And so Jesus and his disciples, they, they leave the confines of the temple and all the things that had happened there, as we've been looking at, and, and it seems that the disciples, for a change, wanted a bit of positive dialogue here. Now, why is that? Well, they had experienced plenty of ne- negative vibes that Jesus had aroused, hadn't he? Wow, he had gone in there with a scourge and he had whipped up crazy all those, uh, those people in the temple who were desecrating it uh, and he had condemned the, the scribes and, and the Pharisees and so there was plenty of negativity. And so obviously the disciples say, hey, let's, let's get a bit more positive. And so they make that statement, look, teacher, what wonderful stones on this magnificent temple building. Well, Jesus didn't satisfy their positive inquiries because he immediately predicts its destruction. It didn't seem that these guys could get anything right. And that destruction actually did take place in history in AD 70 under the Roman rule of a man called Titus. You can read that all about in your history books. It's all there. Now this prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, it was... It so rocked the disciples' boat that they assumed, I believe, they assumed that this, this, this demolition derby was going to be like a, a first port of call of their coming Messiah who was standing before them. Now, they didn't know how this was going to happen, but they were saying, oh, wow, he, he's going to bring it in. The kingdom's coming. And, and the first place that's going to suffer the catapults of whatever of this divine king is going to be Jerusalem and the temple. So they asked, when and what? They asked a what and when question. When will these things take place? And so Jesus immediately lists false signs that the nation of Israel should look out for. In other words, when Jesus is asked about the end here by his disciples, he, gives his, he begins his answer by saying, this is when it will not be. Okay? This is when it will not be. So this period of time is going to be pretty slow for a start, and then it's going to heat up at the end. Don't be deceived. There's going to be things happening, but that's not when it's going to go down. So his first comment is to watch out, take heed, see that no one misleads you. We have that in verse 5. Imperatives, commands. How necessary this principle is for people of all time, and even us today, folks, right? Yet over the centuries, many have ignored this warning. Countless Christians have been sacked in by false predictions and already in your minds you're thinking of people down through the ages and people have risen up and predicted when Jesus is going to come and all these crazy things. And they wake up one day and discover that, wow, the day that was predicted was going to happen has passed and so, oh, well, we were misled. And many of these predictions and some of them by the way some of them by the way are from within what we would call conservative evangelical circles maybe not so out there but certainly subtly sneaking in the back door have written books and movies etc they've been more concerned about naming dates and claiming to know the details of who's who and um, what's going to happen next in God's prophetical program They're more concerned with those things than they have about simply teaching believers to be ready and how better to prepare themselves for this coming of the Lord and his imminent return. They'll be more concerned about those things. And so Jesus warns against confidence in any predictions and in naming world events as signs of his coming. He warns against that. Jesus does not tell us to do that. He says, watch out and see that you are not misled by deception. The Lord is coming, folks. What are we going to do about it? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. The Lord is coming. I'll leave that section with you. On to the next section. And the next point is be prepared to stand firm in the persecution. Be prepared to stand firm in persecution. And we see this from verses 9 to 13. And let me read this section. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. 
and the gospel must be first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Wow. Suffering and persecution. That has been a part of human history from day one. And so because of that, we can say that this alone does not mean the end has come, right? So Jesus' encouragement here is to persevere in times of suffering. It was, it was certainly something that Mark's primary readers would have understood and appreciated and um, it, was, it was very real for them as well because persecution was coming down then in, in a real way. But what we have here indicates that persecution and suffering for believers in Jesus is sure to increase as the end draws near. As the end draws near. So for a time yet future, as well as being applicable for all time, all time, Jesus seeks to prepare his followers for the age to come. You got that? How challenging are these words for Christian church right around even the world today? It has been noted, you know, that the 20th century, we might have think of persecution and martyrs to be a time of the past where, where many people lost their lives, which is absolutely true. But the 20th century, the one we've just come out of, is known as the bloodiest century of all time against Christianity. Thousands and thousands over the globe lost their lives and have given themselves and have been persecuted in one way or one form or another. They've been burnt, even in our time we know of people from Adelaide who were burnt to death in India, going back 10, 12 years ago. Burnt, we have had uh, persecution, imprisonment, tortured, abandoned by family. This is going on all the time in different parts of the world. And so we need to ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, what will the next five years, the ten years, the next twenty years hold for us here in safe Australia, which is way down under and protected from all that stuff, so-called. Will we ever suffer persecution? I don't know. I don't know. Will persecution be our lot in this now safe, protected Australia? You know, and then I ask further, how will I stand? How will you stand when persecution comes? Jesus instructs believing Israel for a future day as he instructs believers of all time, including us today. What does he instruct? Stand firm. Stand firm. That's an order. That's another imperative. Stand firm. Be on guard. And so when we are challenged about our religion, when we're challenged about our religion, our faith in Jesus Christ, what are we to do? What do we do? Here it is, here's the principle very, very clearly. The instruction never changes. Never has and it's not going to be. Why? Because God never changes, right? We are to speak boldly in the power and the confidence of the Holy Spirit and give an answer of the hope that lies within you. That's what you are to do. Do you do that? That's what you have to do. Let us be prepared to stand firm in persecution. And thirdly, we're to be prepared for coming judgment. We're to be prepared for coming judgment. We see this in verses 14 to 23, and I'll just read that. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in the winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. On this section, we may well ask the question, what on earth is the abomination of desolation, which we see in verse 40? I guess to get more detail on this and on who he is, you need to go back to the book of Daniel, which we're not going to do, chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 12. And, um, but what is this, this, this abomination of des- desolation? It seems to be a, a detestable thing. And actually it's described as a desolate thing, a detestable and de- desolate thing. And as I was thinking about this, and we need to understand uh, what went down in even history at that time, Jesus no doubt had in mind something terrible that happened 200 years before he was on earth. And this was like a a bit of an uprising by a man who was called Antiochus Epiphanes. You don't have to remember that name. But he was a name in history. You go to all the history books and you'll find it there. And what this guy did is he erected an altar to the pagan god Zeus over the altar in the holy temple of Jerusalem and he sacrificed a pig on it. Now, of course, that is not a very nice thing to do in the Jewish synagogue, as you can imagine. And the resulting uprising and the revolt by Jewish loyalists certainly made that known and clear. But this historic desecration of the holy place, I believe what it was, was a, was a kind of a, a foreshadowing, a foretaste, or a, a little picture of something bigger that was going to happen. It foreshadowed this abomination of desolation thing. And then again, Jesus probably also had in mind a future judgment on Israel when in 40 years' time from his time on earth, Titus, that Roman general, sacked Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple in AD 70. Okay? And um, that was a terrible thing. That was a, that was a woeful thing. And so it is very likely that Jesus was using both of these these desecrating events to foreshadow this end time, this future event time, when the Antichrist, when this, this detestable desolation would happen, the, the real deal will stand where he does not belong. Presumably in the temple, as was also so recorded in Daniel 9 and Matthew 24. So the biggie of all the abominations to Israel is, is we can call it the mother of all evils that this historic abominations they pointed to. And, um, and we see here in our text that this abomination of desolation is going to kick off something. It seems to trigger other things that are happen. Other way, things are not going to be, you know, okay sort of. Things are going to heat up for a poor little old Israel and also the rest of the world. It's going to kick off what we call the Great Tribulation and which will particularly target Israel. And, um, and this, this time on earth is going to be so bad that the scripture tells us here it requires even God to shorten the days so that people will be spared, especially his elect. Otherwise, they're going to be wiped off the face of the map. So he's going to have to literally shorten the days. And so as I was thinking about this, wow, it seems to be that if Israel thinks the Holocaust back in Second World War period was tough, believe me, they have not seen anything yet according to this text according to this text. But the clear message of this section teaches us all, folks, that God will judge those who rebel against him, right? No matter what the period. Israel rebelled against them. They rejected their Messiah. Right throughout their history, they rebelled, they rebelled, they rebelled. But they were his chosen people. And he made a covenant with them. But they rebelled and no rebellion and sin against God can be winked at. And so they will, as a nation, because they're a chosen nation, will be judged. And the lesson for us is, for all mankind, God will judge all those who rebel against him, whether we're Jew or Gentile. Christian friends, do not tempt God with sinful living, would be the warning that would go down here. Please understand this. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, Hebrews 12 verse 6, for the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and he chastises every son whom he receives. 
Now, I don't know about you, but that keeps me from sinning a whole heap of times. I do not want to fall into the hands of, of a disciplining God. And can I suggest you don't want to do that either? Do not tempt God with sinful and willful living. God's judgment against sin, now or later, is inescapable. It is and will be a reality. This is serious stuff here. Why is that? Because God is holy and he judges sin. But, there's a big but here, but, listen to this, but he is merciful and he's full of grace toward those who obey him by believing in what he said concerning his son Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. If you want to put it that way, there's an escape hatch for you. I love those words that were said to, um, um, said to Lot as he was escaping Sodom. Escape for your life, remember? Escape for your life as he was led out by the hand. His wife couldn't, re- t- couldn't, she, she couldn't resist. She had to turn around and she became a pillar of salt. But the message to Lot was escape for your life. There's an escape for the wrath of God because God is merciful, He's loving, and He's not willing that any should perish. And it's through Jesus Christ and Him alone that we can escape this wrath. Why? Because on the cross, Jesus Christ bore our sins. In other words, He became, as we're hearing this morning, the substitute for us. All our sins were laid upon our lovely Lord Jesus and he bore God's wrath to the full on the cross and he paid the price in the absolute fullness. Now friends, you have got to believe that with your life and soul and if you don't, you will experience judgment to come. God never has and he never will treat sin lightly. So the message for us today and here this section is be prepared. Be prepared. Trust in the Lord Jesus who bore your judgment for you on the cross. Now finally, be prepared, the Lord is coming. We see this in verses 24 to 37. Be prepared for the Lord is coming. Verse 24 says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This is a catastrophic event here. And then they will see, you get this, verse 26, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning the day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 33, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning lest he suddenly come and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Now, it takes no great exegete of the Scriptures to see the main theme that is coming through in this section, right? Be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. It smacks of it all over, through it and under it. Why? Because the Lord is going to come unexpectedly. Simple, right? It will be a little little bit like those occasions and you may have them. I do it to people from time to time. It will be like those times when, when when a good friend of you just drops in on your home. Just drops in. Don't you just love that when that happens? Wow, you may say. If only you had called. We could have done this, we could have done that. Why? My house is in a mess. I look a mess. You probably do. And um, do you get the picture here? The Lord promises to drop in unexpectedly. He's not going to call ahead and say, hey, two weeks' time, get ready. 
He doesn't give us short notice. He doesn't say, hey, get your house in order. Which is a question that we can ask ourselves. Is your house in order right now? Is your life such as it should be? Are you walking faithfully with the Lord as you should be? As you need to be? The Lord's not going to accept excuses when He comes, folks. He's warned us in advance that we should be prepared. I love John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, where it says this, And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. I wonder if you experience restlessness knowing that you are not precisely where God wants you to be right now. Do you have in the back of your minds, wow, yeah, this was very real for me when I was a young fella. I used to always have this in the back of my mind. It was the first thing that came to my mind. I'll, I'll, wait, till, I'll, wait, I'll wait till when I get older. I'll, I'll wait till this happens. I'll, I'll wait till uh, well, when I get married. I'll, I'll wait till whatever. There's always that future look. I'll get right with the Lord and walk with the Lord as I should do, but later on, not just yet. I wonder if you've got that going in the back of your mind. Are you ready to give an account to the Lord today? That's the true question. My dear friend, whether you're saved here today or unsaved, the message from the Lord is this. Be ready, for He is coming. Be ready, for He is coming. And this time, not to give His life as a sacrifice and be treated as He was in His first coming, but the time he's going to, this next time, he's going to come as a sovereign king and a rightful judge of all mankind. And he will be a king ruling in the universe. Turn to him and trust him before it's too late. Be ready. Thank you.